Hi everyone, I'm Eugene, I use he and pronouns. Hi, my name is Thomas, I use he, they pronouns. And today we're talking about uh, strike syllabus week six, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19. Oh my God, Eugene, it's week eight. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, we're presenting this from UC Santa Barbara. Yeah, so yeah. we'll get started. Uh, here's a quote from Mark S. King, an HIV activist and writer, I think just to kind of set the tone of what we're doing. Um, no one cared about people dying of AIDS in the early years of the pandemic. The stock market didn't budge. The president didn't hold news conferences. Billions of dollars were not spent. In the early 1980s, AIDS was killing all the right people, homosexuals and drug addicts and black men and women. There's no comparison to a new viral outbreak that might kill people society actually values like your grandmother and her friends in the nursing home. To have any conversation during the early HIV pandemic meant taking, talking about anal sex and sharing needles and condoms and religion and who God was punishing. We had to climb over mountains of social bias in order to educate people on the basic facts of risk and transmission. Social distancing was easier then because of the bodies of your friends were so consumed by dark purple skin lesions, they were barely recognizable as human. There were no congressional bills promising them paid sick leave or help with their medical bills. They were kicked out of their apartments and then died in the guest room of whoever had the space and the guts to care for them. So, uh, <laughs> you go ahead. No, I was going to um, quote that Eugene just presented us with um, that's sort of talking about HIV and the AIDS crisis and dialogue with COVID-19. Um, obviously the author was talking about sort of resisting and refusing comparisons between these two things, which maybe raises the questions of why we're talking about these two things together. And I think, I don't want to speak for Eugene, but I think part of it, I think we came at it sort of differently initially when we first kind of had this as like a topic header. And I think that's part of the reason we wanted to talk about it, or why I want to talk about it anyways, because I was like, as a queer person, was like familiar with this, Thing in our history, um, it was something on my mind anyways, and then as I was like seeing the first people were talking about it, I just kind of wanted to come to some place about it. <laughs> so this really was helpful for me in doing that. I don't know what Eugene, if you want to say about that. Yeah, I mean, for our generation, especially that like AIDS, the specter of AIDS is, is like affects us differently than, um, than like people that are younger than us and obviously people who lived through younger this. Yes. <laughs> I know we're just 12, but, uh, so I, one, I think it's just interesting that like, just to talk about AIDS right now, because I think it's important. And two, um, I mean, in a class I'm taking, we read an ethnography, um, of a person in New York city during the AIDS pandemic where, um, and the entire class was like, I was reading it and just thinking about now and the, like the comparison, like the health pandemic comparisons are there and people are leaning into them and have been in popular discourse. So I think both of us wanted to address just those comparisons and what, what really they are. Yeah. yeah. So this was tweeted by ACT UP NYC. Um, this, the, the first picture is, um, is a famous black leather jacket worn by David Wojnarowicz. Ugh, sorry, I'm terrible at pronouncing names. I should practice. Um, but yeah, if what? Oh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, if I die of AIDS, forget burial, just drop my body on the steps of the FDA. Um, and who also made this um, this uh, picture? If I die of COVID nineteen, forget burial, drop my body on the steps of Mar-a-Lago, um, Trump's uh, South Florida resort. So I thought it was cool, a striking image to have together. Yeah, and it shows that there are people are making this comparison and it's something that's in the sort of discourse right now. And there's some, uh, we're talking about reasons for that or ways that's happening. One is the kind of like literal continuity of some people sort of associated or who are like around and active during the AIDS crisis who are still sort of politically um, or like nationally active right now and being Anthony Fauci um who had his current position during the AIDS crisis and um ended up working with some act up activists and people um to help not like cure AIDS but to um come to um progress on the AIDS movement um and Nancy Pelosi was first elected to Congress in San Francisco in 87 with the promise of more AIDS funding so this is some, some literal continuities um make it kind of interesting but um, even beyond this sort of literal connections, comparisons are being made in a kind of a broader way. And so I'm gonna show a list pretty soon of some 
articles, but the themes, there's some themes that are kind of dominating some of the discourse that are comparing the two. Um, this is like a complete over generalization, but um, well, well, whatever, forgive me. Um, one kind of line of talking about it is that these are both scary health things. I'm like, let's talk about that. And that um, can manifest in a couple of ways, but just because these are both sort of modern history, health crises, let's talk about them. It's part of the way some people approach it. Um, sometimes the um, angle is more specific about the government's handling of it, that the government handled the AIDS crisis badly and it's handling this badly. And so that's another kind of way people have been approaching these comparisons. Another way, not exactly a comparison, but a way people have been putting them into dialogue is to think about how can the, HIV, the AIDS crisis um, help us cope with COVID. And so we'll talk about some examples of that maybe going on, but there's some articles on this where people talk about their own experience as gay men living through the AIDS crisis and how that's informed their talking or thinking about things going on now. And then another kind of thing that's been happening in discourse is to say there is no comparison and these things shouldn't be compared. So this next slide, it's like very hideous, but it's just to sort of give a list like a sense of um, the way people are talking about things and where these conversations are happening. So there's like things happening in Forbes, er, in Forbes, um, LA Times letter to the editor, Atlantic, New Non X, which is like a gay news outlet, um, Washington Post, Psychology Today Plus, which is about um, HIV positive uh, people publication, and then Washington Post. So on all these different kind of venues and these different kinds of ways, people are talking about HIV, AIDS, and COVID together. And there is some problems with the comparison, as I indicated in like some of those last articles, which are about resisting comparison. And one is about the government and broader social response to the AIDS crisis, which Eugene hinted at in that quote that we opened with. Um, this is just like a very rough and tumble kind of timeline, but 1981, the New York Times first reported on a rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals. In 82, a Reagan press secretary, secretary laughed about gay people dying of AIDS at a press briefing where uh, the reporter asked a question about it. Um, in 85, Reagan publicly says the word AIDS for the first time after the sort of, you know, like four years or more of it um, being the thing people were dealing with and naming and trying to study. And so that's sort of stuff about the government response or official response, but there's also social things happening that made um, HIV AIDS crisis very different from COVID-19. People who contracted HIV could face outing and rejection from their families and communities. Um, this was like a very poorly worded last thing, but um, like partners of gay men who died in HIV were often rejected access to their loved ones in hospital, and they could face difficulties maintaining um, like shared homes or spaces or property if they weren't legally married. Sometimes the deceased's families would swipe in and um, try to take control of those things, maybe even erase that part of their deceased relative's life um, out of the picture. So this is a very different kind of set of social stakes and government discourse around it than we've had now. Also in, in like regards to this brief timeline, um, in 1985 when Reagan did utter the acronym of AIDS, 30, 13,000 Americans had already died of the disease and 100,000 had already contracted HIV AIDS. And um, in 1987, he gives a speech that is actually concerning the crisis, but this like silence continues into George H.W. Bush's presidency um, where it's just not addressed at all by the by the government until like the mid 90s. And so this is all sort of happening, or we've been talking about this in the, um, in the through the lane of thinking about ways these two things have been compared as like historical moments or as health crises. There's another kind of discourse going on. I think it's maybe more interesting and productive for our like approaching some of this, which is um, resources for and about the interaction of COVID-19 pandemic, the disease, but also the pandemic with the lives, experiences, and health of people living with HIV. Um, so there's just another, again, another sampling of articles of different organizations, some of them governmental, some of them nonprofits, some of them just news outlets, um, kind of addressing questions engaging with some about what COVID-19 currently means for people who are living with HIV. And so when we're thinking about, um, and directly to this point, how does SARS-CoV-2, which is the, like, the name of the, this virus, interact with HIV? So remember that HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, leads to immune system deterioration. And AIDS, which is the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, uh, or stage three HIV, is a condition that comes from uh, HIV. So people living with HIV who have a compromised immune system should be extra precautious to prevent infection. So this include, and the CDC does, um, is saying that these include people with a low CD4 count, so low T cell count, a high viral load, a recent opportunistic infection, which an opportunistic infection um, is something like tuberculosis or pneumonia, or people living 
with HIV who are not being treated and who are not on medication, which people could be for a variety of reasons. Also, when we're talking about HIV, uh, we want to remember that with the right access to healthcare, a person with HIV engaged in care is able to have a normal lifespan and be virally suppressed, which, where they can't infect anyone else. Um, and I'm sure Thomas has also experienced this, but like being a gay man is, um, in like in the world, HIV has such a huge stigma with just in our community still that this is something we need to address in all all aspects of talking about it. And so this is kind of like a, maybe a um, unusual uh, screenshot, but one thing that was sort of interesting and in looking at these different resources that we're talking about the intersection of the COVID-19 pandemic with like living with HIV. Um, this is from the CDC website. And one thing that comes up in a lot of these um, spaces is idea of stigma and sort of the scarlet stigma is playing in this. And so you can't maybe see this at the very last bottom thing on this list. There's a list of kind of drop down menu items of questions people with HIV may have. And so the last question is, what can everyone do to minimize stigma about COVID-19? Which is like a fair question given the stakes of what's going on, which we'll talk about. Um, and this is the CDC's answer is minimizing stigma and misinformation about COVID-19 is very important. People with HIV have experience in dealing with stigma and can be allies in preventing COVID-19 stigma. Learn how you can reduce the stigma and help prevent the spread of rumors about COVID-19. Which is great information and it definitely it is framed as what can everyone do. So we should all do those things. But coming from a governmental agency where like the president is spouting off all this like wild shit about um, kind of pro like very racist views about the disease's origin and nature. It's like interesting that they're saying, like, okay, like people living with HIV, you've experienced um, stigma in your life. You should probably stop other people from experiencing it. Just kind of like an unusual take, but nevertheless, part of what's happening in the conversation around these things right now is about stigma. Right, and no responsibility for stigma anywhere else. Like you've experienced stigma, so you should help people learn. What if they had a page that was like what the president should do during this pandemic, and one of them was like the same thing, like stop, right? That'd be, then I would be like less smothered, but continue. Yeah. Um, so in talking about stigma, we want to talk about the power in naming. So HIV AIDS is originally known as GRIDS, gay-related immune deficiency. Also, as Thomas mentioned, it was called the gay cancer. It was also called the 4-H disease which affected Haitians, hemophiliacs, heroin users, and homosexuals. Um, these names advanced stigma amongst these groups, increasing their death tolls, delaying help and aid they could have gotten, causing the disease to be overlooked and how it affected others, including at that time women um, who were not able to get tests as readily available and had to convince doctors to test them. Um, one thing that this did, like the 4-H disease, it decimated the Haitian economy. Uh, which can be its own thing, talking about uh, HIV AIDS in Haiti, um, but also had researchers in Uganda baffled that this was this epidemic was like raging among heterosexuals. I had to be convinced that they could be affected. Um, so the question really for this is like, what does it mean when we call this the Chinese virus? And what does that do? And the answer Thomas I would give you, which we've given in other of <laughs> these lectures, it's like racist and bullshit. Um, and that's why we take pains in really naming and being conscientious of how we're naming things. And a lot of this, in, um, this epidemic is compared to the uh, 1918 influenza epidemic, commonly called Spanish flu. Um, and it was called that because during World War I, uh, Spain was neutral. And so news was able to get out of Spain because they weren't censoring journalism, which caused reports about the disease affecting Spain to circulate as if it was hit particularly hard, which it wasn't. So like these names that we give things have power, have historical meaning um, and continue into the present. So suddenly calling this the Chinese virus or like centering on being ch from China really does some damage that I think will be lasting. So we're thinking about um, how to put these things in dialogue or some of the ways we're trying to put the COVID-19 pandemic and AIDS crisis in dialogue. One of them is stigma and harm to the vulnerable or, or already vulnerable. And so that, that's to be a continuity. Um, so as Eugene already laid out, um, HIV and the AIDS crisis afflicted communities that were already marginalized um, and were sort of targeted or even like, um, we're not like ready targets of sympathy from outsiders. Um, whereas with the COVID, the discourse and the idea about how it infects has been a little different. There was this thing going around the internet like a month ago, I'm not sure if it's still as popular, but this kind of idea that the virus doesn't discriminate or doesn't know borders. And this was the reason we should all sort of rally behind treatments and cures because it didn't discriminate. Um, it sort of had a sort of popularity in COVID discourse. 
And because it may, we, of course, it's not um, limited to certain groups or kinds or places of people. Um, various aspects of COVID crisis have demonstrated that the disease's impact is in fact influenced by pre-existing structural conditions, biases, prejudices, et cetera. And so I'm gonna run through a couple of those in a real quick way. Um, so in one regard, Eugene already kind of indicated as anti-Asian racism and like xenophobic sentiments. So this was kind of recent, maybe it should have been lower on the list, but um, this was like uh, some progressive like news outlets. This is very like condemnation of Trump that Guatemala called the US last week the Wuhan of the Americas um, because of like the sort of number of cases and um, they being the epicenter of this region, which of course was like, it was presented as like this damning whatever critique of the U.S. But it's also a way Orientalists and fucked up. Like the reason that we are an epicenter in the U.S. is structurally and time-wise like very different than why it happened in um, China. It didn't occur. It didn't first occur here. The time we had it, it we had known about it for a few months. So it's a kind of a ways in which we're modeling this and it's sort of like anti-Asian or an idea about the associates. Um, China with disease, which the president again also does, even like, who was his name, Mike Pompeo, they were on um, Meet the Press talking about how, oh yeah, we're pretty sure this was created in a Chinese lab and they get people sick a lot. So it's like a really kind of virulent, like disgusting um, discourse that's present. And this is, of course, the coronavirus is surfacing America's deep seated anti Asian biases. There have been increased reports of anti Asian hate crimes in the US since. Um, the coronavirus crisis has started, and then this is like, oh, I've been talking about Trump specifically, but this is a GOP strategy to blame China. Um, this article talks about it. So it's very much, it wasn't like fabricated of nothing. These tensions and biases already existed and have been um, galvanized by the current um, di disease crisis. Meanwhile, for thinking about infections and death rates in the U.S., um, there's a lot of reports that have been showing and studies that have shown that predominantly black counties account for over half of coronavirus cases in the U.S. and nearly 60% of deaths. Um, so as we're talk going from talking about anti-Asian anti -Asian racism to the ways in which structural conditions, which Eugene will talk about a little bit later, um, disproportionately affect communities of color and black communities. And then the ways in which the virus and its path have played out people are arguing has changed government response to disease about as more data about deaths and infections emerge. So I recall last week about coronavirus was an emergency until Trump found out who was dying or even a lot of the um, push to reopen the economy has to do with an idea about whose lives are at risk and how much they matter. Um, again, so in Georgia and Ohio, this has seemed to focus on issues of paying unemployment, um, the sort of rush to reopen kind of working sector jobs, um, people are suggesting are doing pretty convincingly is fueled at least in part by a desire to not be paying unemployment and limited unemployment um, funds for these people to pay. Um, so like, this is kind of scandalous and extremely fucked up, but Ohio a couple weeks ago was urging employers to report workers who are fearful to, of returning to work once the jobs had opened back up. They wanted to start suspending unemployment payments for people who were not going to work just because they were afraid of the coronavirus. Um, and that was thankfully hacked and being reevaluated and hopefully won't happen. But it's just showing that um, as much as there is some concern about disease, um, there's a lot of sometimes more concern about um, not paying poor people money and making sure they have to keep working, which is fucked. Um, and it's some more specific um, kind of ways in which COVID has perpetuated things that already existed that were awful. COVID perpetuating the police state. Um, so enforcing social distancing um, has been a way to reproduce the state's racial violence as we've seen in New York specifically. So beginning of May, a thousand police officers in NYC were deployed to help enforce social distancing, which like isn't like, I'm not like a big police person, <laughs> I'm not like great anyways, but of course the way in which that played out um, disproportionately affected black and brown people. So a study a couple weeks ago showed that um, social distance policing in New York, out of um, 40 arrests that had been made, 35 were with black people. Um, and there's also a trend of place violence in these encounters so that Time Magazine created a kind of um, compact list of. So these are things that were happening beforehand. We don't know about um, state violence against black bodies, but now it's being done under cover and under the pretense of social distancing. And all this going on while these pictures were circulating, like very, um, very interestingly showing um, predominantly white crowds at parks who are not facing the same kinds of police infringement that, um, the people arrested for social distancing were. There's another story, I'm not gonna talk the whole thing, but um, a woman, a, sc a scholar and activist who was tracking Trump equals plague in her neighborhood in New York who was arrested um, very kind of like wrongly and violently. Um, so just 
showing that this is producing the, reproducing systems that were already at play. Also perpetuating, or at least we can say they are very much informed by settler colonialism, um, the process upon which like this country is based on the extermination of native peoples and replacement of them by outsiders. Um, we've seen this obviously in relation to um, indigenous Americans, Native Americans, but there's a couple of things happening that just speak to this continuing um, part of our history in this country. So in South Dakota, the governor was threatening to sue the Sioux over their coronavirus roadblocks, which they had set up to prevent or to test people um, who are entering their land. Um, the Cheyenne River Sioux and Ogallala Sioux tribes installed multiple checkpoints on roads leading to the reservations in early April as part of each sovereign nation's comprehensive emergency response to minimize the spread of COVID-19. And the Republican governor, who's very much um, aligned with Trump and her views about how the economy should be reopening, starting to sue them, saying that they did not get proper permission from like the travel department or whoever the fuck, um, and that this is not a decision they can do, not something they can legally do. Um, another sort of, this is all kind of thematically related, not causally, but thinking back to what Eugene was talking about earlier about labeling, Native Americans are being left out of a lot of US coronavirus data and labeled as other. So while we do are getting some specific data about um, white, black, Latinx, Asian peoples and like the death rates and infection rates of COVID, we're not getting that kind of specific um, information about Native peoples, which is like super crucial as they have different kinds of access to medical care and PPE. And on that note, um, Navajo Nation president, I think last week, said that COVID-19 had killed 150 people in the Navajo Nation. So it's reported that one rural area has more has more COVID-19 cases per capita than nearly any other place in the United States, which is a Navajo Nation. Um, and the president argued that part of this was due to extensive testing that was happening at a much higher rate than is happening the rest of the population. But nevertheless, there have been issues with the delivery of PPE and funds, and even part of the bailout fund, or whatever it was, the relief, the COVID relief fund uh, was supposed to go, or is going to, um, sovereign Native American groups, but it was in dispute and in limbo. It was supposed to be distributed by the end of April and it wasn't distributed until I believe last week due to um, disputes about whether to just give it to a Native Alaskan corporations or to give it to the other sovereign nations that are living on um, the lower 48 states. So they were delayed in getting funding is the point, um, which other people were benefiting from much sooner, including whatever the fuck Shake Shack. Um, Doctors Without Borders has recently been dispatched to assist Navajo Nation. This is the first time the Doctors Without Borders has been deployed um, within the United States. Well, thanks. So um, when thinking about um, like the history of uh, the AIDS crisis and linking it into COVID, one thing that jumped out to me was the Tuskegee syphilis experiment and lasting effects on uh, like black communities in the United States. So um, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment to like wave at it very, <laughs> very quickly um, was an experiment from 1932 to 1972 with the purpose to study the natural quote unquote progression of untreated syphilis in a population of impoverished African-American sharecroppers in Alabama. The original uh, study had 600 individuals 399 of whom were infected with syphilis and 201 were the control group. Um, so they were able to mechanize um, lots and lots of agencies and individuals to keep these people unaware that they had syphilis, to see where it spread and what happened with it. And it didn't actually end until a whistleblower of journalists um, brought this study to the outside attention because it would have kept going like their idea was from the cradle to the grave to see what happened with syphilis. And then during the HIV AIDS epidemic, this because of this experiment, there was distrust and suspicion of black people against the federal government and the medical system. The theories of government, the theories that were uh, promoted were really um, that the government was promoting drug abuse or they were using AIDS as a weapon of genocide against black people. And what was effective during the AIDS crisis was grassroots organizing um, of individuals and in communities working to promote safer sex, things like that. But this actually went, um, was how the Tuskegee experiment was conducted and maintained using grassroots organizing to like keep people in the study and keep them from, no from knowing that they weren't infected. So it was actually counterproductive. Um, and then into today's uh, today's world, the history of slavery and racism in the U.S. contributes to the present social environment. Just um, 
period. <laughs> like writ large, that's what happens. And when we're thinking about Black Lives and COVID-19, for example, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has shown that um, African Americans account for 32% of all confirmed cases and 41% of deaths, while being 14% of the population. And 70% of Louisiana's COVID-19 deaths are Black patients, 38% of whom uh, the population is made up of 30% of Black folk. So it's um, like Thomas said earlier, while we're saying, oh, it can affect people indiscriminately, there are clearly reasons why this is impacting certain populations more. So some um, statistics, 30% of white workers could work from home um, pre-pandemic, whereas like 20 less than 20% of black workers could. Um, black people are more likely to live in housing dense urban environments and COVID-19 complications increase with asthma and diabetes. And um, black folk are three times more likely to die of asthma than whites and are 60% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. These also affects people with insurance. So 11.5% of African Americans or blacks are uninsured and 22% live in poverty um, versus 7.5% of whites and 9% of whites respectively. So we can see that there's less access to quality health care and more likely um, to live in food deserts. Um, so areas without adequate access to grocery stores, which contributes overall to um, like not good access to health care, which can also contributes to like these high rates of infection and death. And just um, not really HIV or COVID related specifically, but Dorothy Roberts does a lot of amazing work about um, the sort of racialization of medicine and science throughout US history. And I'm obsessed with her and she has a great TED talk. So you should check out Dorothy Roberts if you wanna read more about these structural themes. Oh my gosh, put it in the chat, click below, link, comment, subscribe. I put it in the slide later. <laughs> uh, so when we're thinking about the AIDS pandemic and public health, what the legacy of it was that it challenged public health models. The top-down way of, of amplifying information became bottom-up. Um, for an example, money for treatment went directly to gay and lesbian community groups instead of just going to the city, which could choose what to do with it. Um, the AIDS pandemic came during political organizing phase of the gay rights movement, which paid the way for future political and social gains. But in a lot of the articles that Thomas is, is referencing and, and research that I've read, um, people that who, who have lived through this are asking, well, are the gains work, worth the cost? Do all of these deaths, this willful ignorance, this um, malicious way of targeting minoritized groups, do they, is the future gains worth it? Do the scars that we carry through these crises heal in the long run? It's also worth, oh, you, this is you. <laughs> and so, um, and yeah, just as we're thinking about sort of moving forward from disease or from health crises and what we look for, what we said our goals are, it's worth thinking about these things in dialogue in part because even like as recently as last week, um, the World Health Organization was um, talking about the possibility that COVID-19 will not be something that there will be an immediate, you know, a cure for, that will be an endemic um, disease like other human coronaviruses that will never go away and could be like recurring even. Um, and he specifically compared it to HIV in that way, that there's not a cure for HIV yet. And we sort of had to figure out how to manage that. So just things to be thinking about. And then a quote from Mark Schuf's, the virus is here though, whether we fight for a better society or not. The best memorial we gave to those who died of AIDS was not anything carved in stone. It was a stronger LGBTQ community, more rights, and a healthcare system that worked at least a little better. And I think this, I like this quote because while the question being like, what, is this worth the cost? But if we, if we're, the cost is happening, uh, the virus is here, um, we should, and I'll get to this later, come together as a community, work together to make things better, even if it's just a little bit in the future. Um, so then after all this is kind of like a, a wrap up, like what comparisons can we make between the two? So the first in this uh, Thomas talked about is a monstrous federal government. So there, the reality is there's not enough test kits, masks and gloves generally and for frontline health workers. The federal government's refusal to practice its duty on the public health front with mixed messages and false information and right wing willingness to allow certain groups of people to die. We can see this in the past and in the present. The solutions for the epidemics are in the connection between the medical system, the political system and the social system. They are not distinct, they're embedded in each other. We can see these relationships um, continuing to exist and needing to work. 
between them. And the pandemic also reveals fissures in society that have long been there. So we have an inadequate healthcare system in the United States. New medications and treatments, when they happen, are only available to people with adequate health care and money. Um, you mentioned that one of the corporations or some of the corporations who have been developing trying to develop vaccines or um, cures for coronavirus have committed to make a portion of the vaccine available to people who need it, but they won't commit. Um, they're interrogated, or I guess interrogated um, by the Senate about making it free and accessible to everyone. Bernie Sanders actually was pushing them on that. They fully commit to making a part of it, and they're not in charge of those, all those decisions right now, so they couldn't commit to it. Gross. Yeah. Yeah. Um, houseless yeah. people are not getting enough aid. The public education system doesn't function, right? Um, we are like in University of California and the, our public education system is not public. It is not available to everyone affordably. It, uh, we live in entrenched bureaucracy and elitism. Um, and they're running out of money on top of it. <laughs> What's they got to fill for it? They got no money left. <laughs> so like now we can see like going through COVID, people who make $11 an hour carry the burden of the federal government and their inadequate response. We also see profound differences in race, gender, and class in the United States in terms of who has access to care, whose lives matter, and we see that fear allows the worst to be brought to the forefront. Think of all of the like racist attacks against Chinese and Asian people right now, how during the AIDS crisis, people were kicked out of their homes, um, were like um, actively avoided, um, and there was just huge stigma and bias that was going on. Um, some more comparisons. <laughs> the adequate solutions come from the community, not the elites, right? Like talking about the like what was so um, important during the AIDS crisis was community response, and that was like willful ignorance by the elites. And we can see that now: people distributing masks, food, helping their neighbors, communities helping each other. But also that the political will can change the course of the virus, and anything can be possible. I mean, during the height of the Great Depression in the twenties they were not able to send out stimulus checks to every single person, which happened here. And of course, it's not to every single person, but um, with, the right, uh, with the right attitude, the right will, anything can, is possible, especially now in this like neoliberal nonsense landscape that we live in. Also, I think just not to be like completely fucking shitting on everything, but um, on the other end, just to hear about what some of the demands um, for people like the left in Congress were with the stimulus bill should have, and what didn't end up happening. Even it was great that we got the we got something, but it was such a limited version of what people are imagining, what people are still fighting for. So, uh, or then even on the other flip side, all these jackasses with like guns or whatever not wanting to wear masks. Okay, we're opening up now because like the main white people said so. Um, so the political will is working in both ways. You have to really take control of it. Yeah, and also with research and funding, um, like Thomas is mentioning with vac vaccines, like the entire world is working right now toward a solution, um, like in unison, which is like incredible if you think of the like amount of human hours that are going to that. Um, and a quote from Cleve Jones, during AIDS, I was disposable because I'm a faggot. Now I'm disposable because I'm a phobe. Really connecting the two epidemics together. Um, this is a picture from ACT UP, uh, showing like doing direct action still and being socially distant, which I think is just a great, a great image um, of like continuing to um, uh, like fight power when they, when they can. Uh, last couple slides. What don't we want going forward? So from, the, um, from Winnie Biaima, the head of UNAIDS, there's a risk that the harder and gains of the AIDS response will be sacrificed to fight COVID-19, but the right to health means that no one disease should be fought at the expense of the other. The COVID-19 pandemic must not be an excuse to divert investment from HIV. And they're specifically saying that a six-month disruption in antiretroviral, uh, antiretroviral therapy could lead to more than 500,000 AIDS-related deaths in 2020 to 2021, including a rise in tuberculosis in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and that like and that it def it becomes a like uh a calculus of well we can let people die because we're looking for a cure for covid which should those things should not happen um also what the discourse that's happening is that everyone has to fend for themselves but we're we're realizing that the common good is not a matter of everyone's personal ability that somehow this epidemic will be stopped by everyone fending for themselves and that's not true we realize time and time again, it's like communities are coming together and caring for each other. That is important. So what can we know going forward? That 
we should get to a place where we're talking about harm reduction for coronavirus. Um, so in 1983, activists Richard Ber Berkowitz and Michael Callan, with guidance from virologist Joseph Sonnabend, published a foundational document called How to Have Sex in an Epidemic, realizing that abstinence only doesn't work and it never works, it never will work, um, having to come up with ways of like having safer sex and harm reduction. So thinking and knowing that risk is not binary, all or nothing will fail. Also that shaming dangerous behavior will not end this behavior. People will work to conceal it. We must differentiate between lower risk and higher risk activities. And then we have to acknowledge contextual factors that affect these decisions and the transmission risk. So first off, mental health. Like what, is, what are the mental health tolls of staying inside, of avoiding people, of being in, at Zoom University every single day? Um, those are real risks and real factors that are affecting people. Also, there are structural factors where social distancing is a privilege, where you live, what your job is. Those things affect how you can avoid people. Uh, also, that some people inevitably will engage in high-risk activities. And so we need to provide them with the tools to reduce potential harms. The other thing in all this research is that we need to speak and remember this epidemic honestly and openly. We need to memorialize it and mourn. Um, when comparing it to the 1918 uh, influenza epidemic, um, people's journals and diaries and newspaper stories talk about the loneliness and isolation people experience. But it becomes wiped from collective memory because there was no um, public mourning of these deaths. We get into the Roaring Twenties and it's all about um, production and ignoring it as we're going forward into the future. And I think we need to, as a community, remember that this isn't just going to go away because like suddenly we're allowed outdoors. Think of how many memorials, how often 9-11 comes up in our public consciousness to allow us some sense of like grieving and getting over it and mourning it. Um, this can't be something that we just ignore, the hope we go, that we hope goes away. That also there is no time to waste, that we're all in this together and we have to help, we have to work to make it happen quickly. And that the last thing, as Thomas and I have both reiterated through this whole, this weeks and weeks of courses, um, that we need to remain calm and educated and do not give into the fear mongering tactics that aid in xenophobia, racism, and homophobia. Oops. All right. That's it for us. We did it. We got through it, Thomas. Yeah, we sure did. And next week, we're going to talk about racism, security, and capitalism in COVID times. Remember when I made us talk about disaster capitalism nonstop for like ever? We're doing it again. Part two. <laughs> well, but next week is. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next week. Bye.